Well, I'm not going to take very long because I'm sure that many of you, uh, all of you, will know Professor Dina Das, who is, in my view, one of the most exciting uh, and fascinating uh, anthropologists writing today in, as a tremendous ethnographer, as well as somebody who is intimately familiar with some of the most suggestive work, most famously, of course, Wittgenstein himself, uh, whom she knows very intimately and has supplied very, very provocatively and, and fertilely in her own work. Um, I won't take up, uh, as I say, any more time than to say that we are honored uh, uh, to have Professor Vina Das to talk to us. We've had her once or twice informally she is a very generous person and has come to us, uh, you know, without any special invitations in, in some of our classes. But today she's going to talk to the whole department and anybody else who has come to listen to her. And you will find her both an extremely erudite uh, person as well as a remarkable uh, ethnographer. And so I will ask you to welcome Professor Vina Das. Thank you, um, Tilal, for that very generous um, introduction. I think there are some people in whose um, shade one just grows, and Tilal has been, um, I think, one of my most um, important interlocutors and a great friend. And um, it's just so um, wonderful to, um, to be here. Uh, after I think many years, I have given talks here earlier, and uh, it's always been very stimulating, um, which is why I'm going to take a train back straight afterwards and make my notes right in the train, because I'm sure I'm going to hear some very um, important um, points. Um, I should also say that um, those of you who know my work know that I don't have a very linear form of thinking, and the movements are very crab-like movements. Um, so I never know why I get fixated on some problems sometimes. Um, but this is a text that I'm going to speak on, which I think is a very uh, interesting text from Sanskrit aesthetics. Um, and, you know, one part of uh, writing that I've always done has related to uh, the question of what kinds of things are made to count as knowledge. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in uh, trying to see um, how do we actually find protocols of reading um, which can marshal the text, the kinds of text that I um, will uh, take up today only one text, actually, um, or even a very small part of that text, um, and really you know, try to think them as part of our contemporaneity, not something which is in the past, not something that we you know, need to be uh, faithful to, uh, but something which is part of our contemporaneity and which we are able to receive or critique in ways that um, we do you know, as part of normal uh, give and take of academic life. Um, so I do have some things on PowerPoint, just so that we have some points, uh, because some of the terms may be very unfamiliar. Um, I have to tell you that it also took me about seven years before of reading it before I began to think that I could even talk about it to, um, to anyone. So it's a very difficult text, and uh, a lot of people I know, including Sheldon Pollock, have been working on these texts. Um, uh, sometimes it has, there is one, there are one or two translations, but um, no, um, uh, there are no um, uh, serious commentaries on them, so that, you know, most of it I've relied is on the Sanskrit um, commentaries uh, in the commentatorial traditions in the text itself. Um, so just to introduce this, and I'll come to the problematic in a minute, but the text that I'm going to talk about is uh, 
a 9th to 10th century text called Dhvanyalok by Anandwardhan. And I'm going to, the commentary is, it's a commentary, but it's actually in pre, uh, it's so brilliant that it's actually a recreation uh, of the text um, by Abhinav Gupt, and it's called Lochan, because every commentary in Sanskrit had a title um, of its own. Um, and the main issue, if I was like on a gunpoint and I had to say, uh, you know, say in one sentence what it is about, um, I would say that it's a question of how does des desire reveal itself in what is dhvanitva, which is suggested or resonant meaning. <coughs> so I'm going to take a very brief set of questions. Um, I'm not going to be able to do them justice, but a brief set of questions from contemporary Western philosophy. Uh, and to ask myself, um, in what kind of way um, can we think about what, what are the kinds of problems, in some ways, that figurative language has always posed for philosophy of language. And a lot of these questions have been centered on the metaphor as an example par excellence of figurative speech. So whereas earlier philosophies of language uh, within the Anglo-American tradition dismissed figurative language as the grunts and vows of emotive residues um, in language, this is the famous phrasing of Nelson Goodman, uh, the, uh, betraying what some philosophers would call is the domination of the proposition uh, in much uh, philosophical thinking on language. Uh, there is a uh, question over here um, of uh, fundamentally a question of what is the kind of relationship between what is literal meaning and another kind of meaning. And in the Western context, uh, it's always figured around the issue of what kind of truth conditions can you actually attach to these statements? Can you attach truth statements to metaphoric statements. So if we think about um, metaphor as an example of the problems caused by figurative language to theories of meaning, uh, you know, we can track certain important periods. Um, uh, you know, so there is this earlier period still visible in people like Quine who would say these are the emotive uh, residues in a language. Uh, 1980s, you begin to get an attention, partly because of the very influential essay by Max Black on the cognitive significance of metaphor. And 1980s, you begin to get attention to the so-called imperfections of language. So it's not only metaphor, but everything in some ways which didn't lend itself to the very simple propositional, not simple, but anyway, to the idea of propositional calculus. Um, and these were the imperfections in terms of the fact that there were context-dependent expressions, vagueness, non-extensional constructions, and in some ways a widespread use of metaphor in everyday language and in scientific knowledge. I think that Max Black's uh, contribution was very central to say that it was not only in everyday language, but also in scientific reasoning that metaphor, in fact, plays a very important role. Um, so in some ways, if we think about what the differences might be, and I just summarize, um, um, or, or let me just dwell for a moment on the 90s when we have a period of renewed criticism of the idea of the conflict between literal meaning and metaphoric interpretation. Uh, and this is when, for the first time, people began to argue that metaphoric uh, meaning does not replace literal meaning. Um, it's actually quite a big shift, because earlier the assumption was that metaphoric meaning, um, that there's such a conflict uh, which we experience when we see metaphoric meaning, uh, that essentially metaphoric meaning replaces um, literal meaning. Uh, so 90s is when we begin to get this idea that literal and non-literal meaning are simultaneously present or that they run parallel to each other. Second, that we choose the best meaning and not the only one possible. We'll see that this is actually a very important thing within Sanskrit aesthetics too. 
The third, that the formulation of metaphor as deviant makes the literal the normative, and thus a move that must be rejected. Um, fourth, that we have to entertain the idea that there might be nothing irregular or deviant in language for metaphor to appear. One of the most ex interesting examples I found was in Joseph Stern's recent discussions about the place of metaphor. And he picks up the, just as an example, take the sun metaphor uh, in different places in Shakespeare. To argue that Juliet is the sun, for instance, the use of the word sun is not independent of the literal meaning in the way in which two meanings of bank might be independent from each other. In other words, we know that the bank of the river and the bank where you get money uh, are actually very different. But where we say sun is a metaphor, we can't say that that metaphoric meaning arises because we can get rid of literal meaning. It's actually still dependent upon literal meaning. Um, Yet, like the shifters in language, sun could indicate variously unrivaled brilliance, boring regularity of rising and setting, the pathos of the setting sun or the potential of burning something. And indeed, that happens in different places in Shakespeare. I won't give all the examples, but clearly, if, if the, you know, it is the east and Juliet is the sun, or arise fair sun and kill the envious moon, or thy sunsets weeping in the lowly west are all in some ways very different meanings of the sun, but they are dependent on the actual literal meaning or the explicit meaning of sun. So the variability of these retains in some ways its connections with, um, uh, uh, with the uh, literal meaning. But the parallels between something like indexicals and metaphor are actually not um, uh, complete. Uh, in the case of, say, singular demonstratives or indexicals, the context is relatively well defined. In the case of metaphor, the context is defined by associated commonplaces that arise from common knowledge about features associated with the expression. They need not be true or believed to be true. However, even a deeper engagement with the indexical shows that beyond their function as signifying the necessity of context for truth conditions to be determined, there are darker sides of meaning, such as the first person, which is the darkest reflection on the issue in E. Anscombe uh, in her famous 1952 article. Uh, in other words, I'm trying to say that while most of the linguists and most particularly people like Michael Silverstein, who did so much to bring indexicals so centrally to our understanding of metapragmatics, um, nevertheless don't quite see the fact that you can have very dark meanings uh, associated with the pronouns. And Enskov 52 article, which doesn't get taken up very much in the literature, but is in fact a very interesting article where she says that when we use something like I, because my relationship to the I is not something in, in, in the same way as I can say that one's relationship to she or he might be, um, in fact, it has, she says it's not a pronoun at all. It in fact has very, very dark possibilities precisely because if I were to say that I mistakenly mislaid myself, um, it's not something which would be taken as just matter of course, right? So the point I want to make here is that the remarkable, there, there is a very, uh, last point I want to make is a very remarkable intervention by Davidson uh, who compares metaphor to jokes, dreams, bumps on the head and says that just as a joke causes us to laugh, we don't look for a joke meaning. So he argues we should not look for metaphoric meaning. Rather, the ordinariness of metaphors relies in shifting from the meaning of words to the meaning of sentences. Uh, now, we know that Davidson has staked everything to say that meaning actually resides at the level of sentences. It doesn't reside, reside at the level of words. Uh, and so for him, what causes metaphoric effect of making us see likeness depends on the ordinary meaning of these words and from there to the ordinary meaning of the sentences. So while many, uh, many of the critics of Davidson have faulted him for the obvious fact that his theory fails to take into account the syntax of the sentence, that is, it's not purely words they say and their connection, that is, Juliet and the sun, but also the syntax or the sequence. In other words, if one says Juliet is the sun, that's not the same statement as sun is Juliet. And I think they're right 
uh, to an extent. But it does seem to me that the more fundamental or even a deeper criticism that one might have uh, is that Davidson ties up the meaning of sentence with its truth conditions. So that in the end, it's a question for him really, which doesn't depart that much from the manner in which questions of reference are taken up in the case of propositional uh, logic. Um, so in some ways, um, I think that we could say um, that, um, you know, or, or, or let me let me just skip to the last uh, point in this. That one might also point out that taking metaphor as the primary example of figurative language through which issues relating to meaning and context might be taken up ignores the important distinction between the way that certain figures of spe speech, such as metaphor, metonymy, simile, or synodoc work and the opposite kind of work that other tropes such as irony, hyperbole, understatement do in establishing the relation between literal meaning and figurative meaning. Now, in, in many ways, you can see that um, uh, my discussion of this is very condensed. But what I want to point out is that two very fundamental points. One, Davidson's very remarkable intervention that we don't have to look for something like metaphoric meaning, that metaphors create their sense of being metaphoric just because they are pretty ordinary at the levels of sentences, which I think is quite a remarkable um, intervention. Uh, and the second point, which is what I will take up, which was very important, that earlier it was assumed that metaphoric meaning must displace literal meaning. And this change, namely that metaphoric meaning can and does coexist with literal meaning, is something which was very central to the Dhwani theorists, as we shall see in uh, the unfolding of my argument. So for the Dhwani theorists, there is a trouble with metaphor, but it arises from very different sources. And I'll try to show why it doesn't arise from the fact that our idea of the world is uh, put into jeopardy. It actually arises from the idea that coherence of texts is put into jeopardy. And I'll, I'll come to it, it, why this was so important to them. Uh, the second, which was, you know, this is something on which heads could be actually broken in ancient India, the question as to whether uh, meaning was embedded in words or whether it was embedded in sentences. An enormous amount was at stake, as I shall try to show, uh, you know, in this particular uh, question and these disputes. The third point I'm going to show is that the aesthetic theory actually derives itself from the theory of ritual, which is there's a remarkable movement that happens where in around the 9th or 10th century, um, in which um, the ideas about how to conceptualize ritual, not just procedures for how to perform them, but how to think about ritual, which was a very, very sophisticated area of uh, hermeneutic interpretation, uh, going back to something like 4th century BC, 9th, uh, 10th century, century, it actually moves into aesthetic theory. And I think the consequences are that they themselves begin to talk about earlier aesthetic theory purely as the ancients. And it's a moment of great modernity in some ways for uh, how this theory is seen. Um, okay. So, the first thing uh, is that um, for the uh, Alankarikas, that is the people who thought about figurative language as basically giving beauty uh, to art or giving beauty uh, to poetry, um, were the ones who, you know, who would look at such things as saying which kind of words are more beautiful to use or in what way does the meaning of a word uh, become something which is poetic versus literal. And the dhvanikars, I'm going to call them just the dhvanikars, uh, which is these, primarily I'm talking of these two, uh, these two texts. Um, they place the center of gravity not on the phonetic and 
the semantic um, elements, um, but really they are saying that, um, that for the ancients, they are saying poetic analysis for them consisted of isolation, classification, and exemplification of the ornamental elements within a poetic composition. And these people are saying that, in fact, that is not what is the soul of poetry, that you could do. And you know, it had reached the point in which uh, people were so engaged with the purely figurative aspects. You know, you could get Sanskrit poems of the sort, like this famous guy Dandin, who was for some reason translated all over from Burma to Sri Lanka to you know, various, uh, in various languages and had a great impact on vernaculars. Um, you know, he could write things which were, for example, just using a single syllable, like, you know, no, 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 right? And that would have meanings you could actually do. Or he could write things by which you could read the verse this way, and you could read it this way, and you could read it this way, and you could read it this way, and it would all have meaning. Uh, and the Dhanikars were saying that, look, this is just sophistry. This is not, I mean, they don't say it because nobody ever critiques them in quite the same way. They say, they, they made some very, very important criticisms and then say, we're going to stop here because it's not good to critique the ancients, right? Okay, but it's clear that they marked themselves that as having started something completely new. So let's think of what this newness um, might be. Um, so first, difference that to the widely accepted idea that meaning could be only of two types, namely the explicit meaning of words and the figurative meaning generated either at the level of the word or the sentence, Anandwar then added a third aspect, which is dhani, which could be translated as suggested meaning or resonant meaning, that which resonates. So Dhanilok makes an explicit distinction between figurative meaning generated through the use of metaphor and other figures of speech, and the suggested meaning or dhvani that could be expressed through words, sentences, or even particles of words, or it could be left unsaid. But it was not dependent upon figures of speech. So essentially, the argument that he's making, to which we will come, is that every element of language has this poetic capability. It's not something that has to have an extra something in order for it to become poetic. That the conditions under which anything can become poetic is what is actually at stake. Um, so Dhani, for them, uh, the soul or what they would call the breath of life uh, in language was the ability to decipher the suggested meaning that distinguished poetic beauty from ordinary use of words, but did not displace the ordinary use of words. The second major difference between the Dhvani theorists and the Alankarikas was that of the weight placed on textual coherence by the former, which again was seen as different from the coherence of a plot or a character. Now they knew that uh, you know, the ancient playwright Bharat had uh, emphasized the coherence of plot and the coherence of character. And their argument was that this meant beyond that, that there was something called the coherence of a text, which couldn't be reduced to coherence of plot or coherence of character. Um, so co uh, textual coherence for the Dhvanikaras derived from the analysis of great works. Their favorite was Kalidas, but they would also take the epics uh, and so on. Um, and they would argue that the composition was teleologically oriented to the production of a single aesthetic emotion, such as eros or pity. Now, this doesn't mean that other emotions were absent. And we shall try to see what does it mean to say that you can have other emotions, but textual coherence consisted in being able finally to leave with the idea that this text was either about eros or about pity or about uh, valor or so on. And how was that achieved? How was it that in the end, the emotion that you felt about the text had a certain coherence? You didn't actually end up with a wide array of emotions of which you could make no sense. So the significance of these two differences will become apparent later. 
But let me at the moment turn to the fact that, um, uh, as Makriya has uh, noted in his brilliant analysis, um, that the Dhanilok, and in fact the text itself, uh, mentions not only the Mimansa, which is the interpretation of uh, ritual, but also uses examples from the grammarians and the logicians. Now, these are different school in Indian philosophical texts, right? But he, the, 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 the aesthetic theory will quite explicitly use things and say the Mimansakas say this or the Nyayakas say this, so that they are thinking that aesthetic is not independent of how logic has been thought about on the one hand and how theories of ritual have been thought about on the other. Um, so I will have to spend a little bit of time on the, on the Mimansa uh, and see where the influence of the Mimansa laid. Uh, this is formulated first in 200 BC by Gemini, uh, you know, and the texts are actually best known to us from commentaries from the 4th century AD, uh, and then later from the 7th century AD. Um, and I just briefly want to say that because they look like, you know, that they are only about ritual theory, uh, there's been a tendency in, even in Indian philosophy, till recently to dismiss them as of no great importance, partly because of the pernicious influence of Radhakrishnan, who thought that the great Indian philosophy was only in the uh, Upanishads and the Vedantas, but, and all this ritual theory was purely uh, mumbo jumbo. Uh, but in fact, it had a very, um, we, we, we'll see that it, it, it's philosophically very, very interesting. Um, Okay, um, the, the big question for the Mimansas was the fact that because of the fact that, um, um, that in the Hindu theory of, uh, or at that time in the Vedic theory of creation, uh, the world is not something which is created by the gods. It's actually self-created. And the function of gods is purely to hold the sacred language, right? So the big question was that ritual often consists of injunctions, right? You need to do this or you need to follow that. And for them, the question was how do we know, given that we know that there's no author of these injunctions, you know, nobody has ever authored it. There's no God who's commanding this for us. How do we actually interpret this? And how do we know that these um, uh, techniques actually, we have a correct interpretation of these techniques. Um, so, um, so first and foremost, they thought that while simple words were considered to be universal, sentences were specific and particular. Uh, and the most important part over here uh, it was the fact that um, you know, compound word sentences were particular and specific to a situation, they were not universal. And this feature of language, namely that each component in a sentence or in a compound word limited the meaning of other components, is what allowed Vedic injunctions to be followed in specific ways. And this is actually a very important point, which is really that they're saying it doesn't come from any external authority. It's purely the fact that within a sentence, and which is why the sentence is very important, you need to see how a particular component can restrict the meaning of other components. And it's in their interaction that you can arrive at a particular interpretation which you can consider to be uh, functionally coherent and um, uh, correct. So the first, the, um, uh, the sentence is functionally coherent. It was known as ekvakyata, which means that a sentence can only lead to one injunction. You can't simultaneously be saying, they've that bring me water, and they've that don't bring me water, right? So that in, in way, how do you actually arrive at that particular um, uh, understanding, given that we have no authorship and we have no one's intentionality, which is through which we can take recourse to it and say we know, because so-and-so meant this to be doing that, right? Um, there is some debate as to whether the meanings of the particular words that make up a sentence was retained or whether it disappeared after the sentence was made. But I think that the most important thing to remember is that in any given sentence, the Mimansakas argued that it is the element of becoming 
or being brought into being, which was actually known as bhava. This is in a sentence, it's the element of becoming or bhava that is important. Um, so for every sentence, they would have to say, what is it that has been brought <laughs> into being? So take the famous thing, you know, Devdatta cooks rice. And they would say, in this particular sentence, what sentence, what is being brought into existence is the cooking. And that everything else is already accomplished. That is, Devdatta is not being brought into existence. Cooking as an act is not being brought into existence. Rice is not being brought into existence. Pot is not being brought into existence. Fuel is not being brought into existence. So what is it that is the bhava, which incidentally is also the word for emotion, what is it being brought into existence is the fact of cooking, which is not included, which we can't take each sentence and say, oh, this is the, sent the word accomplishes it. It would have to be the sentence which actually puts together things which are already siddha, which are already made, but putting them together allows something new to be born. And we'll see that this has very, very, very interesting consequences for ritual itself. So such a theory of meaning which is oriented to action, yet within the constraints of the Vedic injunctions, will affect the way we construct the procedures for extracting the best meaning and not the only possible meaning. Now, they were perfectly aware that I could take a sentence and get a different meaning. And they're saying, really, the interesting question is, how do we know this is the best meaning rather than the only possible meaning? It's really a very interesting shift from saying, oh, is this arbitrary, is this non-arbitrary, to the question of how do we extract something which is the best meaning. I'm going to take a very, uh, you know, a absolutely iconic sentence, uh, which I've actually, if anyone is interested in, uh, reading that in greater detail, there's a very dry paper that I have which was published in um, Man, as it was then called, uh, in 1983, which is in fact on this particular phrase. Um, the phrase is called uh, Swarg Kamahaya uh, and it's the iconic phrase. And it, what it means is um, one who's desirous of heaven might perform the uh, sacrifice. It's not must perform the sacrifice, right? Uh, injunction is never in the form of must, but actually, very interestingly, it's in the optative mood or in the subjunctive mood, right? So then they will say, now, what is it that is being brought into being? Uh, so if, because if the verb yajet, may perform sacrifice, is the dominant verb, then what is it that is that it is bringing into being? The answer then becomes, let the desire of the sacrificer, swarga kama, how is the sacrificer being defined? He's being defined through his desire. This is a very big difference from Christian sacrifice. He's not the bearer of sin. And it's only his desire which actually authorizes him to perform uh, you know, the sacrifice if he wishes, right? Um, so, so, so then it is his desire. And what is it that is being brought into being? And they say it's heaven that is being brought into being. Right? So it's not that heaven pre-exists before this sentence can be interpreted, can, is uttered. So you can't say there is a heaven, one who wants to get it should perform this sacrifice, because then by their own rules, the sentence would be fully accomplished. It would not actually you know, produce anything new. So what is new that is being brought into existence is heaven itself. And you can immediately see how in aesthetic theory, it would lend itself to the idea that what is being brought into existence is a aesthetic emotion, not something which already in fact exists, right? Um, and this interestingly was, uh, it had very, very crucial consequences uh, because you know, in the Vedic texts, <coughs> things like, um, uh, you know, if, you, if you say that you have an oblation to offer and you say this is for Indra and for Varun, the oblation would be different than if you were to say this is for the compound Indra Varun. And so their opponents would say, what do you mean? I mean, Indra is Indra and Varun is Varun. Why are you saying that you're going to make different um, uh, oblations to them? Because grammatically, the two are differently joined. You can do that in Sanskrit. You, know, you can join them through a conjunction or you can join them through a particular kind of rule by which the two have equal status but are joined uh, you know, by a relationship and not by a conjunction. And their argument was, 
No, because it's the sentence which has brought them into being. That is, gods don't exist independent of the sentence through which they are being brought into being. We would have to have completely different oblations for them, right? Uh, so in some ways, you can see that um, from this particular point of departure, we can now ask what ideas do the Mimansaka authors propose for overcoming the literal meaning in favor of a figurative meaning? Instead of assuming that we speak metaphorically when truth conditions for literal interpretations are absent, here the shift from literal meaning happens when an injunction appears to be inappropriate in relationship to the teleology of the text. But unlike the interpretation of metaphor in even such a daring philosopher as Davidson, that metaphors cause us to see resemblance at the level of sentence meaning, the Mimansa texts postulate that figurative meaning can appear at any level of language, at the level of words, at the level of whole sentences, or in the particles of the words. So three important moves have taken place here. First, the discussion of figurative speech does not privilege an uh, alankar or a figure, however beautiful, for it is now seen as only one of the ways in which literal language might have to be overcome in favor of a figurative interpretation. Second, dissonance with literal meaning occurs not when a figure of speech is counter to our experience of the world, but when a sentence is contrary to the overall unity of the text. In other words, they're not saying, oh, you know, we have this cognitive dissonance because, you know, if you say she's wearing the mantle of sorrow, you know, we can't see a mantle of sorrow. I mean, they're saying that's really uninteresting. Um, what they're saying is, what happens when a word looks, when a sentence looks absolutely ordinary? And I'll give you an example. It looks absolutely ordinary and yet creates really cognitive uh, dissonance. Um, it's a very, you know, very, very, two very dry examples, but this is how where grammar comes in in very central ways. Um, so one is purely, say, um, uh, with whole grains. He sacrifices with whole grains. And they say, but since whole grains has been put into the accusative, and accusative means action is directed towards that, right? I go to you, it is directed towards you. But that cannot be the, uh, teleologically, that cannot be the reason why the sacrifice is being performed. And therefore, they say this is figurative. It has to be understood in terms of a general thing that they have to perform this, but not in terms of a specific thing. The second th example, which is a little less dry, uh, so this is a period when you know Shiva, who's in the Rudra form at that time, uh, is a god who is not particularly admired. You know, he comes and disrupts the sacrifice, but they have to deal with him, right? And so, quite interestingly, when they say how uh, uh, you know how uh, Shiva is, to, how Rudra is to be precated, the exact sentence is Pashuna Rudram Yajet, which means by means of the animal, instrumental case, Rudram. Accusative case, Yajet, may he perform the sacrifice, right? Now, much later, generations of grammarians say, how did Panini gives this example to say how the accusative might be used? And generations of grammarians say he got it wrong. Because if you are going to offer something, you need to use the dative. But Panini was no fool. I mean, here, what happens is that by the use of the accusative, they managed to insult the god. Right? Here, you take this kind of, you know, you, 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 you insult the god because you've used not the dative which would be used to honor, despite the absolute, I mean, there is a, in Panini, a particular, um, um, particular rule which says that for Yaja, you must always use the dative. And by not using the dative, they actually manage to insult. For them, that's the kind of example in which the teleology of the text will tell you that the sentence is correct, despite the fact that it violates a particular grammatical rule. So I've demonstrated two things. One, that purely at the level of a particle, a cognitive dissonance can arise, right? Because I use the accusative and not the dative. Or because I, in both cases, the examples are of accusative or of the instrumental, right? That uh, this dissonance can arise. So then the main debate around explicit meaning centers around the question, what is the difference between the meaning that resides in words and that which resides in sentences, which comes to the next question. Um, so what happens to the meaning of words when they knit into sentences? And here again, I think they take the help of logicians 
Um, you know, and they say the, the so, so there is a particular mode of argumentation in uh, Indian logic, which is known as uh, um, as the Ghatanyaya, uh, the logic of the pot, um, and the logic the logic of the clay and the pot, um, and they say, well, it's not that the word uh, sentence com or the word meaning completely disappears. But what they say is, think about a potter when he's, you know, when you're kneading the clay and you are playing with it and you're doing things to it, what you have is a feeling of clayness. You make that clay into a pot. It's not that the clay has disappeared, but the feeling of potness arises, right? And so they say it's not that the word meaning actually disappears, but the <coughs> feeling is that of a full sentence. You now don't think of each word separately, but you think about the whole sentence as actually carrying that particular um, kind of meaning. Um, so they say that in order for this to happen, there are three features of the word that allow sentences to be made. First is the desire of words for other words. Now, this is very interesting. They're not saying it's we who put the words together. They're saying words are very lonely without each other. And so, you know, they really need other words to, uh, they crave the company of other words. Um, and then second, the capability of a word to be combined with another. Not all words can be combined with each other. And third, which is very lovely, is the fact that they have to have a proximity. So they're saying, you can't say, today I said bring, and one year later I said water, and you expect that the person would be able to understand that I wanted him to bring water. You know, there's somewhere you can't say, I today love three days later, you <laughs> one year later, and expect the person to understand that you love her, right? Uh, so, it's a, so, but these things reside for them in the character of words, not in the character of people. So that words have that particular, uh, you know, way of being in the world. I think there's a huge lot of discussion about uh, ontology, um, but in fact, this is an ontological question for them. This is not a question which one would say is a question of epistemology only. How do we know it? But it's the being of words which is at uh, stake. Um, okay. Um, so there is a second level of meaning, which is pratiyaman, uh, and that is uh, yeah, uh, the, the, and that is something which arises again at the level of sentence, but is dependent on the overcoming or impossibility of the first meaning. That's a little like the way we think about metaphor often, that you know, a metaphor means we displace the literal meaning and then we can arrive at the metaphoric meaning. They're saying that's very specific to one particular thing which is called Pratyaman. And um, I'll give you the example of that. Um, that is Pratyaman and then you will see later that there is a third level of meaning which is absolutely central for them, which is Vyangyartha, which is the suggested meaning. But let's stay with Pratyaman for a moment. Um, and they say that this pratyaman, the, the idea of it pratyaman arises through similarity of contiguity. And the uh, pratyaman, which is the interpreted meaning, is the body of the words and of meanings. So they're not saying meaning is the soul, word is the body. But that this interpretation is what is the body of both the words and the meanings. So they're not saying like here a word, there a meaning as, um, as Wittgenstein would say is the problem. They're saying that there is a body which both words and meanings have. But the soul of uh, language is Vyangyartha, which means that uh, in the first case, Pratyaman is that which cannot bear the literal meaning. Right? So that's where, and I'll give you an example, which is like metaphor, to say it asks for the literal meaning to be discarded. But uh, Vyangyarth, which is the suggested and resonant meaning, is something which depends upon the ordinary meaning continuing to stay. It's not like a ladder that I've taken and now I can throw it away. It depends on the fact that both ordinary meaning and suggested or resonant meaning must stay together. I mean, I, I, I personally think it's actually really quite a, quite a fantastic argument and it makes me think of Wittgenstein's argument that you know that the physiognomy of the word means that when I say the word feed 
other meanings such as saying that I feed the child, I feed the meter, I feed your pride are already there in the, or are already shadowed in the notion of, of feed. And that's what he says gives life to language, that the physiognomy of the words involve other uh, potential. Uh, the Pratyam, uh, the, the, the Vyangya, the suggested or resonant meaning is not just in one place. And that's why they're saying you can't say, is it in the word, is it in the sentence, it is in the grammatical particle, because it can be in anywhere. And they actually compare it to the charm of a woman. Uh, and they say there are women who, if you were to disaggregate their features, uh, you know, you'd say there's nothing in, you know, nothing beautiful in her, but the charm is such that the woman seems to be most beautiful. Now, two examples that I want to give you, first of Prithiyaman and second of the Vyanyat, and they're very, um, uh, very, very interesting. Um, this is, again, I don't have time to dwell into this into great detail, but what's so fascinating is if you read all the works on uh, translation by, let's say, Bidou when he's talking about translation, or even Jacobson when he's talking about translation as transposition, it always assumes this separation. For the Dhvanikars, what's so interesting is that they're completely invested in classical you know, kind of poetry. But the first example they take is from Prakrit, which is the vernacular language, right? And the example, some of you probably will recognize it. This is a young maiden who goes to the, you know, to the monk who's walking around on the, on the banks of the Godavari River. And she says, oh, revered one, you can now wander around freely because the dog who used to bother you has been eaten by a lion. Uh, the reason why I say that you might recall it is that Lacan uses it in a very big way in, uh, in, in, in a creep. Okay. Now, what is happening over here? They are saying, obviously, you know, the woman uh, uh, is, is, you know, she, she wants to meet her lover over there, right? She can't go and say to him, you know, you're really coming in the way of my being here with my lover. And so she's saying, you know, the lion, uh, yeah, the dog that used to bother you uh, has been eaten by the lion, and presumably the guy is more scared of the lion than of the dog, and so we'll leave them alone. Now, very interestingly, for Lacan, um, Oh, sorry, that's a second example. Um, for Lacan, uh, who takes this example, and he says that what this shows, he's saying, is that the unconscious, uh, one, that the whole word does not exist, and second, that the unconscious only speaks in half-truths, right? Cannot be, right? and he takes this example to say there's always this half-truth. There's a very interesting debate at that point with the logicians uh, who say, why do you say that this is Pratyaman meaning, you know, inferred meaning? This is just logical inference, right? And their re retort to that, and here I think um, um, Lochin is absolutely brilliant because, um, you know, what Abhinav Gupta says is that, look, when there is inference, so if I say um, the, um, you know, when I see smoke, there is fire, I have to be able to see something. But he or she cannot see the lion. Second, there is no explicit statement. She's not saying to him, I, you know, want to, I want to meet my lover over here, right? So actually, it's purely from the interpretation and from the fact that a half-truth has been spoken that a actual truth tends to arise. Um, OK. Uh, let me just take the next meaning. Uh, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, I've just put this up, the one in Sanskrit, uh, without all the uh, transliteration, because I'm going to show you what these words mean. The, the, the verse is purely, uh, the, again, the example is they're never, uh, you know, pol they're never correct, politically correct examples. So this is a woman who's there with her old mother-in-law. Uh, her husband is away, and a you know a traveler uh, is. Uh, they've invited him to come, and uh, you know he can rest uh, the night over there. Uh, but she can see that he would really like to come to her at night, right? But she can't say anything because her mother-in-law is here. Uh, so what she says is, Swashru atre shete atra aham divasam pralokya ma patik ratrand shayam ayoh shayya gaha, which is to say, Swashru uh, atre shete. My mother-in-law sleeps here, 
Atra aham, and I sleep here. Divasam prolokya, look at it clearly during the daytime. Uh, ma pathik, pathik is the traveler or traveler, ratranda, blinded by the darkness of the night. Uh, do not fall on the, uh, uh, you know, on the other, on the bed, right? Uh, now, there's ob at one level, obviously, what she's saying to him, be careful, I'm not the only one over here, don't come shouting and saying, hey, here I am, and so on, but that, uh, you know, how she's signaling her desire is very interesting. Because what happens over here is that women spoke in Prakrit, right, which is the vernacular language, but men can hear it in Sanskrit, right, because every Prakrit term can be translated into Sanskrit, right. Now, what happens is two things. One, the term divasam. Now, divasam in Prakrit can mean the diminutive day, right? And so, whereas in Sanskrit, it would just mean the correct grammatical formation, right? So, by adding, putting that through the Prakrit, she's managing to convey this wretched day. Right, it becomes diminutive, not the grand day, but this diminutive, you know, day. Uh, and and he, he says that she's managing to convey to him that she cannot wait for night to come; that this is indeed an absolutely wretched day, right? Um, uh, so the diminutive, in some ways, uh, you know, because uh, in the masculine it becomes diminutive, in Prakrit it is neutral. Uh, that becomes this. And second, her use is uses that of uh, the. Uh, is the use of the uh, double, the dual, rather than the single, by which she manages to convey the fact that he needs to be very careful of the fact that her mother-in-law um, is over here. Now, here, what is happening in some ways is the fact that in each case, he's saying poetic meaning actually arises by a grammatical particle on the one hand, and it arises by the fact that both of them can actually inhabit two languages simultaneously. He can hear what the, 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 the Prakrit neutral is, and she can speak correctly in Sanskrit. So he can hear it as a correct Sanskrit term, and he can hear it as a Prakrit term by which the day has been made into something diminutive. Uh, last two points, and I will stop. Um, so one is the question of production of aesthetic emotion. Um, uh, which is really, um, um, uh, you know, the, the point I said, in the end, is it that you just produce one emotion? Yes, you do just produce one emotion. But he's saying that the risk that the poet takes is always about the fact that he has to play with other emotions in order for a final, uh, you know, the, the, the singularity of the emotion that he wants to hold comes up. It's like Indian music. If you ever hear Indian music, you know, the musician is playing one rag, but he'll always flirt with the other ragas. And a really good musician can make you feel as if you've gone into this other rag, but bring you back just from the brink of disaster, you know, back into, uh, into the actual proper raga. So similarly, I mean, the very famous examples that the text take um, is, um, uh, you know, in the, um, uh, this one, which is a lament, which is that in the case of a lament like in the Mahabharat, uh, you know, when the women are seeing the dead bodies lying there, this is a very famous lament which says, this is indeed the hand that used to lift my garment, which crushed my mound like, my mound -like breasts, which brushed my navel, my thigh, my leg. And so a previous self is evoked, allowing intensification of grief, but also intensification of the erotic um, suggestions which happen over here. The last example that I want to take, which is a huge, like three uh, section in the text, is how does newness arise? You know, they're saying, okay, this is poetry. How, how can poetic emotions be generated from the ordinary, so to say? How can we, the fact that the poet is so bound by tradition, how can he actually generate something new? And this example that um, I take, which is not their example, so I'm very proud of it, it's my example. Um, it's from Bhavbhuti. Uh, who is a 12th century ra person who again rewrites the Rama story. And this is one thing in which, you know, in the text, Rama is supposed to go, Rama is the great virtuous king, as you probably know, uh, and he has to go and uh, kill the Shudra, which is always seen, he's done his kingly duty by going and uh, killing the Shudra. But in Bhavuti, uh, and this is um, uh, Sheldon Pollock's translation, where he says, oh, my right hand, bring down this sword upon the Shudra monk. 
and bring the dead son of the Brahmin back to life. You are a limb of Rama who had it in him to drive his, his beloved Sita into exile. Why start with pity now? There, you have done a deed worthy of Rama, right? And there are two things over here. Uh, one, this O seems very neutral, O oh my right hand. But actually, in the text, what it is, is re re dakshina hasta. And re re, the text would say, is the way in which a grammatical particle, a particular form of address, can be used to show contempt. And so Rama is, while he's doing his kingly duty, is showing complete contempt for himself, which is then intensified by the fact that Dakshina, the, so they, they say, why, why is he using Dakshina? You know, the, it's redundant. And in poetry, you should never use something which is redundant. Why didn't he just say hand? Well, Dakshina is both right hand, but also an accomplished hand. And what is it that he's accomplished in? comes up, he's accomplished in the fact that he had driven Sita into exile. So he's accomplished in cruelty, which is what makes sense in the end when he says, you have done a deed worthy of Rama, at which point his own name becomes absolutely unbearable to him. Right? So they're saying that, in fact, the po rise of poetic emotion within tradition must also play with risks, as I said earlier, of playing with various whatever. Second, that it must take absolutely the ordinary and make the ordinary resonant. Great poetry is not that which uses primarily you know, recognizable figures of speech, etc. It uses absolutely the ordinary and makes that completely resonant. And third, that the newness which arises might arise by a simple mechanism of putting a small grammatical particle somewhere, rather than, you know, our idea of criticism is always, you know, we are standing in the court of justice and uh, you know giving very indignant uh, notions but their notion of criticism is how can you make the text grow to actually realize the potential which was there but which had been suppressed in the earlier masters so i'm sorry i don't have a very smart conclusion and that's the story of my life that you know uh, with it and if any of you have suggestions on that i would really welcome it but um, you know, this is where I am at the moment, and so I think it's the right thing to just stop there. Thank you.